welcome very much to Science and Engineering Council of Santa Barbara's uh, monthly meeting. Most of you know that in addition to this meeting, we had this always on the second Wednesday of the month. We also support STEM scholarships through our association with the Santa Barbara Scholarship Foundation. And I would encourage you all to think about donating to that program. Uh, we also have yearly science fair awards, which is sort of, eh, you know, we don't know quite what's happening with that this year, but we will let you know if there is a science fair and how we will proceed. We want to say thank you very much to our sponsors, which are listed on the uh, screen. We're very pleased to have them, and a special thank you to our charter sponsors, the Community West Bank, where, where the live portion of this meeting is taking place. So with that, uh, I'd like to recognize some of the board members that are at this meeting. Uh, would you raise your hands? I'm not sure I can see who's here besides Yvonne DeGraw and Bill Theringer. And Bob is on the Zoom. I'm sorry? Bob is on the Zoom. I oh, Bob you. Lilly. Okay, I'm right now looking at the screen and I don't see who else is here. So we're pleased to have you today and I will let Yvonne DeGraw, our program chair, introduce today's speaker and talk about upcoming programs. Okay, thank you, Mary. Um, our monthly programs are held on the second Wednesday of each month at noon, both in person and on Zoom. And our speakers focus on topics of current interest from a science and technology angle and include extended time for Q&A. Our outreach programs include STEM scholarships administered through the Science Scholarship Foundation of Santa Barbara. On October 11th, Dr. Stephen Wilson from UCSB's Materials Department will be speaking on Research Frontiers in Superconductivity. And on November 8th, Dr. Larry Martinez from Cal State Long Beach will be speaking on Ensuring the Sustainability of Outer Space Orbital Debris Dilemmas. As always, feel free to contact me about particular topics or speakers you would like to suggest. And subtitles are available during today's talk if you enable uh, the captions in your Zoom window. You can put questions into the Zoom chat during the talk or ask them after the talk. And a recording of this meeting will be available on our YouTube channel within a week or so. Our speaker today is Dave Muffley, Senior Arborist and Horticultural Futurist. He has been planting trees, especially oats, in the Bay Area other California locations for more than 30 years. Dave began his free career where he received his undergraduate degree in mechanical engineering from Stanford University. Moving from engineering to ecology, he managed native oak, planting, oak tree plantings at Stanford in a project that has yielded more than 4,000 established oaks in 40 years. He then branched into fruit trees and urban tree plantings with a special focus on street trees. He subsequently became a board certified master arborist and designed and oversaw a thousand tree freeway sound wall planting. This radical and experimental thousand tree drought adapted planting succeeded far beyond expectations and laid the foundation for changes reverberating through the California tree nursery industry today. In 2011, Dave was hired by Steve Jobs to oversee the massive and shockingly successful Apple Park Mega Campus planting. So welcome, Dave. Okay. You guys will give me a moment to share my screen. We'll get into the, get into the slideshow. Of course, it worked beautifully when we were warming up. Now, as I attempt to do it, I don't know what I am. Yeah. 
give me a moment. Many apologies. As oh, typical, as typical when you try to use <laughs> <laughs> There's a delay. How much do I owe you for this? Uh, I haven't paid. Oh. Okay, it was, it, yeah, no, you walked up and it, and it saved me. Okay, now the technical difficulties are out of the way. Can everyone hear me clearly? Can the people on Zoom hear me clearly? Do we know? Okay. Yeah, yes, 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 we can hear you. Yes. Okay, tell me when you, when you're all set. Okay, so first, thank you all for inviting me. I want to offer special thanks to my friend Cliff Warren, who is the fellow who invited me and suggested that I come speak to you guys. And I, I did have an apology to give to Cliff. He had a very specific title that he wanted me to write this to, and I kind of missed that. <laughs> so uh, I have first. So the title is kind of general, but what Cliff wanted. He wanted to see trees as a barometer of climate change. Okay, so what can I tell you? Luckily, that's a critical part of my talk anyway. So you are going to hear a lot about tree barometers of climate change, thanks to Cliff. And I even have some prizes for it. So, so on the screen, you see the Apple Park mega campus. So that was built between 2011 and 2018. The building itself is a mile in circumference. The walls are entirely made of glass. So there's six and a half miles of glass panes, 40 feet long, 10 feet tall, curved, and made in Germany because there was only one company on the face of the planet that could make that much glass wall. So... I was hired by Steve Jobs. Steve Jobs told his head hunters to go find me Stanford's arguments. And we'll get to that part of the story. But Steve had, without us realizing, been watching all of our reforestation at Stanford for 30 years when he hired me. He'd already seen what I was capable of doing. So we planted 9,000 trees around the spaceship. I hand selected every tree. So inside the ring in the center is a fruit orchard with a thousand fruit trees. Steve originally wanted all apricots, but I said, you don't want 20,000 apricots in two weeks. And I figured they'd kill the arborist if I did it. So I designed them a sequentially ripening orchard with more than 30 different fruit varieties. And when the building's in use and not shut down for pandemic, they actually harvest the fruit. Can't ever let employees touch the fruit trees or they will break it, fall down, sue up. So we actually harvest and right down into the cafeteria receiving area and up it comes. So that was a, that was a fun aspect of this. Much of the planting is oak trees because I am an oak expert, internationally known oak expert. And there aren't that many oak experts. Oaks are really confusing, but I really like them. So there's native oaks. There are not quite native oaks. There are a little farther away oaks and there are oaks from much farther away. So I had the pleasure of giving two tours in the Bay Area this weekend to people. And I can't get inside. Apple and I had a little blow up at the end. Um, you know, six and a half years after Steve died. So I got to go walk the perimeter. The perimeter is three and a half miles and look at my trees after the rainy year we had. And it's quite spectacular. So there's a little intro. Oh, how am I supposed to go to the next? Uh oh. Sorry, I've got a little technical difficulty for some reason. Oh, that's how I change slides. <laughs> so there, that gives you a close-up of the building. That was taken at the Worldwide Developers Conference last year. You can see those glass walls. All the hallways are just inside the glass. 
and you can see all of my trees there. And so just to prove that I'm for real, there's me as the arborist. And I'm a scent protection guy, so that's why there's a giant straw hat shoved up inside the uh, inside the, the hard hat. <laughs> and at first they laughed at me, but by the end of the project, many of the personnel were copying me. Because it's not that much fun to stand in the blazing sun and do construction. So that was me. This is a funny article. You can find this on my website if you want to read it. They, they called me a hippie arborist, and I was like, so there's me from past time. So in Palo Alto, California, for about three years, I was the bicycling arborist. That's a 13 foot wooden orchard ladder behind my bicycle. So I did that for two years until my 40 something knees suggested that I, I needed to become a consultant and possibly get a car. So I trained at Stanford University, earned my mechanical engineering degree. My intention was to become an automotive engineer. And right at the end of Stanford, I decided I wanted to have nothing to do with that. I didn't own a car for 15 years. I've done 75,000 miles on a bicycle. I don't really ride a bike anymore, but I've certainly <laughs> done my time. So now back to Apple Park. There you can see the view out and you can get a sense of the amount of canopy. And that was a year ago. And the trees got a lot bigger after the rainy season this year. And there you can see what we always see. On a sunny day, people always stand in the shade. And there they are standing in the shade. These The photos are from Wired Magazine. Hey, and, you know, Apple had a launch yesterday. And it was launched from this campus. So you can probably, and Apple always features my trees in all of their PR. So if you go to their website, you'll see my trees. So I'm gonna show you some of the insane things I did. So I have the honor of having spent more money on trees than any arborist in human history by some measure. So what you're looking at there is the largest tree we moved. It's a 60 by 60 foot oak with a three foot trunk. We picked it up with two construction cranes. After a year of preparation, we set it on that, which is a, an army surplus tank transporter. And we drove it across the campus because we couldn't drive it off the site. It was too big. It would block every roadway. Well, I'm proud to say, and in that photo, it looks kind of thin. It's getting to be winter, so it's thinning. Well, here is the tree from Google Street View last year. And this year it looks even better. So it's kind of a game to reestablish really large trees, but I did it right apparently, because it's looking really good. So one of the things that's happened at Apple Park, so we took the old Hewlett Packard main campus in Cupertino, California, and we leveled it. I signed the death warrant of 3,800 trees that were all crummy parking lot trees. And we brought in 9,000 trees, all of which are good biodiversity trees. Now there's foxes and hawks and squirrels and monarch, but everything moved in. So it did exactly what it was supposed to do. There's another one of the extraordinary, oh, by the way, that big oak that we moved, that cost roughly a quarter of a billion dollars to move one tree. So these guys are only like 100K each. So those are redwoods that we've got on flatbed trucks moving them around like Christmas trees. So it was kind of weird for me. I'm the guy who'd always planted acorns and suddenly Steve Jobs hired me and I had to transplant 100 foot redwoods. So I had to do some clever catch up learning. But given how well everything works. So this is where I started. This is Stanford University. So there is an 800 acre open space, hilly open space land behind Stanford University. That is a radio telescope on the left and it's been part of the SETI operations. It was constructed, I think, with Navy funds in the 1960s, but it's visible both from Stanford and from the Freeway 280. So the land itself is named after that radio telescope. It's called the Ditch. So 
the reason Steve Jobs hired me is that the dish at Stanford was Steve Jobs' favorite place to walk. And he loved to walk. He had meetings walking. Steve was a huge believer in walking. So there's three and a half mile path. And he was walking there the whole time we were planting oaks up there. And there you can see a little bit, probably a little hard to see, Hoover Tower in Stanford is toward the left in the background. And what you're looking at, those tubes are called Tubex Tree Shelters. And they are plastic tubes that act as many greenhouses for small trees. We pioneered their use more than 30 years ago, and it's worked beautifully. So we planted close to 4,000 oaks on that land. And this is how we did it. Tens of thousands of volunteers over decades. And there you can see how we watered every tree, no irrigation systems, two years of bucket watering. Lots of Stanford students, community involvement, lots of exercise. When I first started out, we had Stanford's 1963 water truck. And we, a bunch of us would ride on the top. We'd strap five gallon buckets to it. And lo and behold, we established a lot of trees. There's a close up of the tree shelters and you can see how the water it works. It's really quite beautiful up there. And the project itself, is what taught me about trees. So there's the land. So Stanford University is up to the right. The Stanford Dish open space is kind of a slanted rectangle there in the middle. It's completely denuded on the freeway side because that's the south side and it was heavily cattle grazed. So there we are. These the photo actually from, I think, 1984 showing original volunteers putting up big protection devices in cattle grazed areas. Trying to protect trees from cattle is a non-trivial exercise. As you can see here, you can see how it worked. And we established many trees that way, but we also did this. When we learned to put the tree shelters inside the wire cages, and suddenly we get stuff like this. So not only have the trees grown, I've got trees that I collected the acorns for 30 years ago that are 50 feet tall. I got lots of 40 footers and I've got tens of thousands of 30 footers. So now we're gonna get into, I've given you a little background on who I am and where my knowledge comes from. And now I wanna start taking you into the climate change barometric indicators. So what you're looking at in this photograph is a young blue oak emerging from its tree shelter back in the early 2000s. There are three kinds of oaks at Stanford, one of which is here in Santa Barbara. Post Live Oak is all around us, all the way from Mendocino down to Baja. It is our most common native tree. At Stanford, they also have valley oak and blue oak. Blue oaks are very beautiful and slow growing, very beloved. But what I learned, picking, go, being the guy who got 3,000 acorns, we planted all those blue oaks, 30, 40 years later, we got nothing to show for it. Blue oak no longer wants to grow in that area. So this has been predicted by forest ecologists for more than 30 years, that as the climate shifts, Trees will not be able to move. Trees cannot get up and walk. So that's going to be an important concept that we're going to talk about a lot as we go through here, because I seem to be the guy who understood what climate change was going to be decades before everyone else. And I prepared California for climate change. And we'll go into those details. What's killing the blue oak is what you can kind of see here. That's a 30 year old blue oak that's six feet tall. And all of the white colored foliage is powdery mildew. It's getting too wet, too humid for the tree. It wants to be in the foothills of the Sierras and it is no longer able to survive in the Stanford area. And our work has proven that. Here's a close up of, it's pretty hideous stuff. It's a good picture of an ugly phenomenon. And so this is an image. Now we're going to go into some scientific <laughs> studies, give you guys a little something to chew on. 
So the blue outline that's pretty well filled in with red and yellow is the current range of the blue oak that we've been looking at. And, that, and there is a blue finger that extends right to Stanford. So I'm, this is information, this is from a study about 15 years ago, where they projected the future range of various trees in the United States. So this is more or less current range of blue oak. Well, let's roll through the scenarios for what climate change is going to do to blue oak. Oh, almost eradicated, but moving north. Uh, almost eradicated, still moving north. Oh, we're way moving north, way into Oregon, and now we're into Washington. Now we're heavy in Oregon, virtually nothing left in California. So I'll just dwell on that for a second. So that's California native tree, and those are reasonable scenarios for the next 50 to 100 years. We're seeing this kind of movement on landscape level. So I'm going to tell you guys a terrible statistic. So since 2016 in California, scientists have been doing a tree mortality survey through forested lands in California. In 2016, they found 18 million new dead trees in California. Last year, 2022, they found 32 million new dead trees in California. Those are native trees dying exactly as the forest ecologists warned us about 30 years ago. So here's more. The powdery mildew is also, a, this is a valley oak, a big, mature, beautiful valley oak. And you see how the foliage is white? That thing has probably 5,000 shoots that are a foot and a half long that are fully white, having been ingested by mildew. So the future, that, that tree will not be in that area much longer. So there's a young one which has the same phenomenon. And there's a close-up image of the powdery mildew destroying the new growth. So I focus on that because my job that I gave myself, which turned out to be my job, is that I started to figure out, what okay, trees are moving. What do we need to move here now? that will withstand future conditions. So in this photograph, that's powdery mildew on a valley oak. That is a little tiny bit of powdery mildew on an Engelman oak, which is native to Southern California. It's native from Northern Baja, literally to Pasadena. So I have been instrumental in first testing the tree you just saw, the foliage, that is a tree I test planted at Stanford University in 2003. And well in advance, you know, it was 20 years ago. And I wanted to try it out and I tried it out. Now it's nearly 50 feet tall in 20 years. And it's arguably the most beautiful tree on the campus. Stanford is about to start planting them in quantity. Because, as you're going to see, there's trouble all around. So preparing for climate change. So forestry and biology are hip to the idea of assisted migration. Because we are sh shifting the climate so quickly, we have to intervene and attempt to move trees to climate zones where they will be adapted in the future. And this will give you an idea of climate shifts. There's a website called Shifting Cities. And what it shows is the climate projection for LA for 2100. This is old data. That's more like 2050 now. But it's showing you the climates of Central America shifting to LA, essentially by mid to end century. So those are the kind of shifts that, that I am attempting to prepare for. Here's more impact. These show where, where city climates are going. And it's, it's really quite shocking. And I caught on to it on the ground because we started to see trouble in the early 90s. So I'm not going to try to explain this graph, but if you, if you study graphs of CO2, you'll see where it's CO2 levels that have not occurred on the planet since before Homo sapiens evolved. 
So we are now in climates that our species and pretty much none of the homo, I'm not sure any of the homo genus has experienced the same levels of CO2 that we are now. So where do you go if you're looking for a shifting climate? Where do I go to look for new trees? Well, luckily, Northwestern Mexico is a global biodiversity hotspot for oaks, pines, orchids, and a bunch of other plants. And those are exactly the trees that we need to be shifting to California. So this is what's called the Madrio, Madro Tertiary Geoflora. So there you go. So now we're, so I'm showing you where my targets were for trees. Now I'm gonna go back and show you a, a little bit of a, another project. So I referred to a thousand tree tree planting that I did, that I designed 2006, 2007 in East Palo Alto. So I circle it there. That's the 101 freeway running between Palo Alto and East Palo Alto. And City of East Palo Alto asked the nonprofit I was working with to plant trees along 2.2 miles of sound wall strip. So there are the sound walls, 2.2 miles of that. And that's what they gave me as a place to plant a thousand trees. It had been herbicided for 20 years. So it was really not a very appealing <laughs> spot. So this is original Street View. This image is from Google Street View, but it's 2007, so the cameras were crummy. So now you can watch. I'm going to give you a full time lapse. There are actually trees planted in this photograph, so watch what happens. So there we go. About three years later, we got the trees are up, and we've also mulched the whole thing to get rid of the weeds. So here we go, about six years in, and we've got trees that are doubling the height of the sound wall. And here we are, this is another three years and the trees are getting big. People are starting to ask me about, Dave, what are all those crazy trees coming over the sound wall? Well, that's what I did. And there's 2017, so that was six years ago and they're still doing really well. So this planting was studied by a UC Berkeley graduate student her PhD in urban forestry. And what she discovered in three years of record keeping was that this planting had the highest survival rate of any urban planting ever measured in America. So that was pretty good for a freeway sound wall. Now I'm gonna show you a little, a little something else. So now that tree, now we're focusing on, on one of the trees in the time lapse. And that is a tree from the areas of Mexico that I was telling you about. In fact, that is the most common of all the oaks in the mountains of Mexico. It's called net leaf oak. And that is the first tree that was ever planted, the first net leaf oak ever planted in the public right of way in California. And it grew phenomenally. So there's the tree. If It's hard to see the base, but the poor thing was hit by cars, two cars, one from each direction. So now I'm gonna show you what that looked like. So I came out there one day and one of the best trees I'd ever grown had been hit by cars from two directions. And I thought it was done for. So I took that photograph to record it, but watch what happened. Oh, well, the tree didn't care. The tree put on an enormous amount of wound wood, compartmentalized the wound, and it can, sorry, that's the end slide. And it continues to grow beautifully to this day. So just to give you an idea, I'm bringing in trees from the wild, putting them in incredibly urban situations, and they're handling it. So, I'm sorry, that slide is in the wrong place. We're gonna skip over it. So this is the net leaf oak that I was just showing you, but this is the new growth. It's this beautiful red color all over the tree. People love this tree. It's gorgeous. In fact, there's the one that's planted at my house in Mission Canyon, in Santa Barbara. I grew a lot of trees and that's what I put in my yard. So I wanna show you the leaves, 
The leaves are really large. And in this photo, they look dusty because the tree grows next to a dirt road and they're dusty. They catch it. But also notice the acorns, the little green dots that you see there. So it's pretty interesting. We brought this tree from Mexico, put it in Berkeley Botanical Garden, Striving Arboretum in San Francisco, and it started to make seedlings. And this is the barometer of climate change that a tree that grows as far south as Guatemala is happy to make seedlings in Berkeley. And in fact, it's happy to make seedlings in many, many places. So that's kind of a, a warning about the tree that I tell people is you're gonna get more. So another interesting thing about the tree, that's a close up of the underside of the leaf. And it is called net leaf oak, in part because the bottom of the leaf looks like a net. But I learned something really interesting about this tree by accident. So I was not only the guy who planted these trees, I was the guy who pruned them. So one day I was out pruning that tree right there. You can see the branch clippings on the left of the tree. I was pruning it up. We left the branches down to the ground when it was young, but as it got big, we want to lift it up. So I went in to prune the tree and I literally had to climb into the canopy. And when I walked out from under, having finished my pruning, the young volunteers that were with me audibly gasped. And they looked at me and they pointed. And I said, what? My face was completely black with soot from having pruned the tree because that bottom side of the leaf collects tire dust and diesel particulate right off the freeway. These are pollution scrubbing trees. And I literally had never, the way I learned that was because I stuck my face into it. <laughs> Ain't nobody ever told me about that. that came, you know, <laughs> I, I stick my hands in my face in a lot of places and I've learned a lot of things that nobody else knows. <laughs> so that's the net leaf oak and it's a really cool tree, but I wanted to give you a feel for, it's a tree from thousands of miles away that's doing brilliantly. <laughs> in some of the toughest conditions in California. Is it deciduous or not? Evergreen. Evergreen. Yeah, if you're going to filter pollution, evergreen all day. And if I had it to do over again, I'd plant those sound walls with just that tree and scrub that freeway pollution and keep it out of people's lungs. <clears throat> so, okay, I'm going to tell you guys a really interesting story since we've got time. So netleaf oak was a tree that I'd seen in, in botanical gardens, but you can't pick acorns out of botanical gardens and I wanted to grow it. So I called up Striving Arboretum and started talking to somebody there about the old guy, the fellow who collected them, Dr. Dennis Breedla. And he had retired by that time, but they told me that Dennis Breedlove had a property in Bolinas, which is the hippie surf town just north of San Francisco. He owned property there and he planted a bunch of these around his property. And they said I could go look there. Well, at the same time, a consulting arborist colleague of mine talked to a friend who worked in fish and game in Marin County in Bolinas and asked about the tree. And she was freaked out. Said, There's a Mexican oak up here in Bolinas that's naturalizing. It's growing on its own. <laughs> and I was like, cool, that confirms they're there and producing. So within a week, I simply drove my car to Bolinas and drove every street in Bolinas until I found the trees. <laughs> Bolinas is not large. <laughs> so we started growing trees from there, but now I'm showing you this giant big box trees. So when Dennis Breedlove went to Chiapas in the mid-1980s, he put trees Berkeley striving, but he also gave a bunch to Pacific Nursery down here in SoCal, and they grew a bunch of the trees. And in 2013, when I was buying every good tree in the Western United States for Steve Jobs, I walked onto a big specimen tree nursery and the guy was driving me around and there were five giant net leaf oaks in 10 foot boxes. And I flipped out. I literally flipped. And what I ended up learning 
was that they had bought those trees in like 1988 from Pacific Nursery and they had grown them in boxes for 25 years until I showed up and bought them and put them back with their siblings. So when you go in deep, you, you run into all kinds of weird things. So this is the Apple Campus, that's Netleaf Oak. Apple liked the tree so much, they planted a line of 125 of them to screen residents from one of their buildings. So that was pretty fun. Now we're gonna, we're gonna skip back into the overview portion. That unfortunately is a picture of the Stanford Arboretum. So I'm currently consulting for Stanford University because all their trees are dying. And uh, we did, I with my, some nonprofit colleagues, did a bunch of oak test plantings at Stanford. And Stanford this year figured out that my test plantings are surviving while their existing trees are dying. So they hired me, not surprisingly. But those are a picture of the coast live oak, our most common native oak dying in the Stanford Arboretum. Yeah. That's a no death? No, no, no. So no death hasn't come down to the flatlands. It's something else. So this is actually Santa Barbara over by the cemetery on the ocean. Those are a bunch of coast live oaks that are nearly dead. Yeah. Photographed them last year. And now we're going into Southern California. This is Eastern San Diego, right? At San Diego County, right outside San Isabel. And I'm about to introduce you to the tree that is probably gonna save California's ecosystems. So it's hard to see in this photo, but there are a bunch of dead skeletons of trees, and then there are live trees. All the dead trees are coast live oak. All of the live trees are the California native Engelman oak. So what we're seeing in the areas where a native tree is getting pounded, another native tree is thriving. So on the right is a dead coast live oak, and on the left is a thriving Engelman oak. So now I want to talk about coast live oak again. The blue outline in the yellow and red shows the current range of our most common native tree, the coast live oak. Now watch what happens. Boom. So what we're likely to see is that our native, our most common native oak is probably on the way out within decades. And what's going to drive it is increasing monsoonal moisture. So now we're going back into Engelman Oak Habitat right outside San Isabel. Big, beautiful, gorgeous blue colored trees. These are now the hottest selling tree in the nursery industry. And they were barely known before I started Apple Park. So they're really lovely trees. And there's a, a view of what it's like underneath one. And there's a young one growing on the Santa Rosa Plateau up above Temecula. And there's the foliage. You can see really nice oblong bluish leaves. There's the acorns. And that's what I'm known as, is I'm the acorn guy. I'm the guy who goes all over the Western United States to find acorns. At Apple Park, I collected acorns from Texas, from New Mexico, lots from Arizona and from all over California. So that's Engelman Oak acorn. And now uh, you can't see it very clearly, but that's an Engelman Oak with like 10,000 acorns in it, just packed with seed. And there they are. You can see there's the little acorns and you see the little tap roots, man. Even in a box, they want to live. They'll sprout anywhere. So this photograph, that is actually a thousand Engelman Oaks growing at the biggest tree nursery in California, Devil Mountain Nursery. So we, we proved these things on Apple Park and now the industry has put them into production and there's our little seedlings. And we use special air pruning containers, which I'll get to toward the end of the presentation, but I, those are those are our beautiful little seedlings that are turning into trees all over the state. Engelman Oak is fascinating because I showed it to you in the wild, but here's a 200 year old tree in Arcadia growing next to a mortuary in a lawn and happy as can be. 
So that just shows if it can grow in the dry wildlands and it can grow in a place like this, you've got a tree that is going to survive in a lot of places. And that is exactly what we need at this moment in history. There's another big Engelman from Arcadia in the Fallen Leaf Lake neighborhood where there's a bunch of them. Interestingly, here's a whole street of Engelman oaks, but it's in Australia. <laughs> the Australians use the tree more than we do, although that's going to change really quick. But that was the that was literally the only street planting of Engelman oak I could find from anywhere in the world. So, but of course, now I'm going to do my own. So that is the Apple Park campus under construction. You can see the giant cranes, the giant temporary green sound wall. But now watch what happens next to the street. Oh, look, a whole bunch of Engelman Oaks getting planted in 2015. Oh, here they are a couple of years later. Oh, they're looking pretty good. And here's the last photo I have. They're way bigger now. I should have grabbed some photos this weekend. But they're doing beautifully. So my Apple Park plantings were the first plantings of Engelman Oak along the streets in the Bay Area. There's only one of them in all of Santa Barbara. It's this barely known superb tree. And there's another, some more of my young yeast from, from Apple Park. That's Apple Park also. So just to show you, I go out and get the acorns, but they do grow into trees. It works. So here's another acorn. I'm going to take you into a, a journey with, there's only really other one other big oak that's native to Southern California. And this is it. This is an acorn of the island oak. Island oak grows on the Channel Islands. It is not actually native on the mainland of California, although people have planted them here. So I knew about the tree, and this is the biggest one I know of on the mainland. That's from Santa Barbara Botanical Garden. And that is the queen of all the mainland island oaks. I don't know, I think it's 80 to 90 years old. And, and we've grown a lot of seedlings off that tree. It's a, it's a really good mama tree. And there's the leaves. And they're, they're weird. It's a really old oak lineage. And it doesn't look like modern oaks. It's kind of this weird throwback. And interestingly, I learned it used to be widespread in California. So the last time we had CO2 at this same level, about 5 million years ago, Island Oak was in the Bay Area. So turns out that it's a pretty cool tree. There it is. Those are the catkins and the new growth emerging. And there's an Island Oak and a dry parking lot in Sandy Meadows. So the thing's really tough. So you're getting pictures from all over the place because I'm the guy who ferrets out the trees and either collects their acorns or takes pictures of them. This, if I don't have pictures, I got nothing. So that's Galito, uh, Galito Water Department. There's an island oak on that little mini lawn right on, um, blanking on the name of the main road there. Hollister, Hollister. Hollister State Street turns. That's on Hollister. And this one's up at Native Sons in Arroyo Grande. So, okay, now I'm going to do one of these weird little time lapses for you. Um, so this is Santa Barbara, and that's 2012. And you can see the Araucaria, the weird tree on the right. You can use that as kind of a backdrop. Sorry, folks. My computer just decided to stop working. We do it. Yep. Okay. Now we're back. So there you go. Little Island Oaks put in, same spot. That's 2015. Oh, here they are in 2018. Terrible street view photograph. A uh, slightly better photograph that I took of them because they're only about a mile from my house. So they're continuing to grow. So Island Oak works all over the place even though it is the rarest of all California native oaks. So I really wanted island oak for Apple Park. And there were none in production in the industry. And when I wanted a tree for Apple Park and it wasn't in production, I just went and found acorns. 
So I talked to the guy who started the first and biggest native plant nursery in California, Dave Frost, up at Native Sons Nursery in Arroyo Grande. And he had collected in the 1980s a bunch of acorns off the island oak at Santa Barbara Botanical Garden, and he grew a crop. And he kept track of where they'd been planted. So when I needed acorns and I couldn't get them off the islands, he told me where they were. And I ended up finding three trees at Arroyo Grande High School. <laughs> and one of them. So some oaks never produce an acorn, and certain oaks are mamas that dump acorns year after year. And my job is to find the mamas. So that one at Arroyo Grande High School, we produced more than 10,000 trees for the nursery industry from that tree right outside a classroom. And that, what you're looking at there is my tree grub. Uh, that was down in Fillmore at the big Brightview Nursery. That is the first set of island oaks ever grown in California and is rapidly becoming the most popular tree in our nursery industry. So it was pretty fun. So I'm gonna give you one more native tree and just to prove that I don't only talk about oak trees, we're gonna talk about pine trees. So this is a photograph from Stanford and that is a Tory pine. You guys may have heard of Tory Pine State Park down in San Diego. Tory Pine occurs there. But what's funny is in Tory Pine State Park, the soil conditions are terrible. It's really nasty. And the trees are all stunted. They're like 25, 30 feet tall. But they figured out more than a century ago when you take seeds of Tory Pine, grow them and plant them in good soils inland. That's a 120 foot tree that was planted by Frederick Law Olmsted under contract with Leland Stanford in the 1880s. Hmm. So we got some serious history and out of all the trees planted in the Stanford Arboretum, that's the best one. So I've become a huge Tory Pine fanatic and they're kind of scattered around Southern California. But this is the photo for my friend Cliff Warren. In the background, the big trees are a pair of Tory pines. And this is taken in Santa Cruz, right along the bike path on the San Lorenzo River. But I want you guys to look close on the left hand side of the screen in the foreground is a young seedling Tory pine. Nobody planted that. Well, squirrels planted that or jays planted it. But there you go. There's Torrey Pine naturalizing 500 miles north of its native range. So these are the kind of barometers that I use to see that, okay, everybody's saying the climate shifting. Well, the trees are saying it too. So you guys may know Torrey Pine. This is the, what's it called? Lucky Llama Coffee Shop Carpinteria. Mm -hmm. That's the giant pine tree in Carpinteria. So that's your biggest one. And there's a beautiful photograph of it. So my best photo of the tree is a structure shot. Yeah. There's also a Tory Pines on the channel. Yeah, Santa Rosa. Oh, that's right. And they're also doing a program to propagate those. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So it's a great tree. All our Caltrans clover leaves should have Tory Pines in them. They put in crappy little purple leaf plums and dead little red buds, and they can be putting in giant habitat trunks. So anyway, I won't say too much about that. But for those of you who are mechanically inclined, I do want to I do want to point out to you these. Okay, I'm going to just point it out because I am a trained mechanical engineer, although you can't really tell from what I've said today. But I want you. You can't quite see it. The cross section of those limbs is like that. Mm -hmm. So when a tree senses stress, which in this case is on the underside, pine trees add wood to the underside as though they're building I beams. Oh. So all of, you know, I look at trees and I see the flying buttresses from our Gothic cathedrals and our medieval cathedrals. And I realize we learn from nature. That's what that's that's who, where we started. And I just went back to it. 
terrible picture, but on the right is a Torrey Pine. That's Golden Gate Park. They planted Torrey Pines. They also planted a bunch of crappy Monterey Cypress that have all fallen apart and landed on people. A bunch of dead eucalyptus. Torrey Pines all look fantastic. So it's a really good tree. This is from Aquatic Park in Berkeley. There's a couple of them in a yard in Cupertino. So they're kind of all over. The, and these are at Santa Cruz growing next to a freeway. So it's a really good tree. It's a really cool tree. So we are getting toward one o'clock. Ah, now I'll tell you this. So this is one of the Torrey Pines from Stanford. And this is where I learned the Torrey Pine, they, they are very dense. They aren't really shady. They're kind of really loose and open, which means that evergreen oaks can grow directly yeah. underneath them. They can tolerate it. And that appears to be, this is that same tree up close. So you can see the Torrey Pine just towering over the oak trees. And I think Frederick Law Olmsted, the guy who did Central Park, he may have designed that. But regardless, I'm the only other, I'm the only human being I've ever heard talk about this phenomenon, but I applied that at Apple Park. So we planted out 60 acres of oak woodland. All the way through the woodland, we put in little Torrey pines. And over the coming decades, the Torrey pines are going to shoot over the top of the oaks, and they're going to put this giant blue umbrella over the landscape. And it's going to be kind of shocking for people, but it's already happening. Okay, now we're getting into the last part. So the other place to look for trees with a warmer climate and that it has more monsoonal moisture, the sky islands of Arizona. That's a photograph of Mount Lemon, which is immediately behind Tucson, Arizona. Tucson's at about 3,000 feet. Mount Lemon goes to about 9,000 feet. And at the top is a ski resort. Did you know there was a ski resort on top of the mountain next to Tucson? I didn't until I drove up there. <laughs> so what I realized as I studied the Skylands, they have lots of really cool pine trees. They have some great sunsets you see there. But elevationally, starting at about 4,000 feet all the way to 9,000 feet, you got 10 different kinds of oaks up and down the mountain like a layer cake. And what I'm showing you here on the left is annual precipitation amount of rainfall. And on the right is elevation. So when you're at the bottom, so the oaks are coming in about the third line up from the bottom. So the oaks started about 15 inches of rain a year. And then by the time you're at the top, the topmost oaks are getting more than or essentially double that. And that 15 to 30 inch range is the rainfall of coastal California. That's like 80% of coastal California has exactly that rainfall and exactly the same temperature profile. So I did that little bit of sleuthing and then I started to go get the trees and bring them back to California. That is a silver leaf oak, they're gorgeous. And we'll show you some more pictures. That's, a, that's another nice silver leaf oak in habitat. More of them. This is Madera Canyon outside Green Valley. And there's the leaves. Dark green on the top, silvery white on the bottom. People love it. It looks like an olive tree. Mm -hmm. And I learned the tree. Hoyt Arboretum there is in Portland. And a buddy of mine got a net leaf oak planted there. 30 years ago, 25, 30 years ago. And this is a photograph I took of it in Portland, a thousand miles north of its native range in 2009. So that was 14 years ago. Well, back to Dave's, Dave's dumb uh, uh, street view uh, time lapses. There's the tree. Wait, let's do this again. So there it is, 2009. There it is in street view in 2017 and it's like five times taller and there it is in 2019 and it's a big beautiful tree that people love and there is the first tree it's hard to see it's inside the anti-tank fence at apple park that's the first silver leaf oak grown in california and it's 25 feet tall now
So it's doing really wonderfully. That's apple planting young silver leaf oaks as street trees. So this is actually the oak from the very top of Mount Lemon. So, and it's a tree that has never been described by science. When I go searching for acorns, I find stuff that I can't find anywhere in any reference book. And even all the oak experts that I know all over the world don't know what the heck it is. So oaks are very complex and not well described because there's never been any money in describing oak tree varieties. So we just don't know much about it. But that leaves a lot of room for a crazy guy like me. So collected a lot of acorns. Almost all those acorns are in production. They're trees now at Devil Mound Nursery around the state. And back in 2022, the New York Times sent me an article. They wrote it for me. It says why we should all be collecting acorns. 20 years after I started, there's a cover photo from a magazine article I did in 2008. Now, last stage. Why'd you guys give me a lot of time? Because then you can hear a lot. <laughs> so unfortunately, this is what the root system of most of the trees produced by our nursery industry looked like for the last 60 years. And we have a hard time growing trees. There's a lot of stunted trees. You start looking around, you're going to see a lot of trees that never grow. And it's because roots aren't supposed to go around each other. They never move. They just strangle each other. So I had to fix that to make Steve Jobs forest. So oh, when the roots are crappy, here's what happens. So that's a Mediterranean cork oak that can grow to 120 feet. That is the parking lot uh, near the farmer's market in Santa Barbara. And you see the base, how the tree's short and the base is fat. There's a close-up. So the reason the trunk has that bell shape is because there's more fungus in that trunk than there is wood because the, the defective roots set off a variety of infections that ruined the tree. That is what a cork oak trunk is supposed to look like. You see how it's straight, nothing weird at the bottom. There's a busted one, there's a good one. And they were in the same planting. They were probably planted the same day from the same nursery. There was no consistency in the industry. So. You remember that horrible root system I showed you before? These are the root systems that we grow now because of an air pruning pot system called Pioneer. And that's the root system of a native valley with all the material stripped off. So the way we make a root system like that is a little conical basket that sits in a rack. So you see those racks, they just slide in 32 at a time into the rack. And because there's all the slits around the container, the roots are exposed to air. And there you go, you see one loaded and growing. But, so an oak always throws a taproot and that taproot will go down four feet before anything happens above ground. So what happens in our air pruning containers, which are held above the ground, the taproot comes out and then it dries up and dies. When it dies, it then releases all the buds above it on the taproot. So next photograph, you see those little white roots sneaking out? Those are all the roots that have been initiated because of the air pruning of the taproot. And as the side roots grow out into air, they will also die back in and then re-sprout. So instead of this coil of depth, like we used to make root systems, you pop that thing into the next container and stand back. We've never seen trees grow so fast because we figured out how to do it. There's a five gallon. You see all those little roots? Those white roots grow in one night and then they dry off the next day. Roots grow way faster than anybody thinks they do. So, and this is my friend, Dave Tashler. He gets a special mention. He is the director of horticulture at Devil Mountain Nursery, the largest nursery in the state of California. And he's holding up the pioneer air pruning tree because this is the first time our industry has ever seen good root systems. And that guy's happy because he was the guy who they assigned to help me grow all the trees to Apple Park. 
And we changed everything the industry does. We change the pots they grow in. We change the kinds of trees they grow. We change the way they water. We change the way they prune. We change the way they stink. And that is the result. There are now tens and tens of thousands of these new climate change adaptive assisted <laughs> migration species. And people are buying them in droves simply because they're really good looking cool trees that grow well. And this industry has been hungry for new trees for decades. So when I showed up with a couple dozen new types, it's pretty shocking how quickly the things have changed. So that was my last slide. <clears throat> And since we didn't do many questions, I'm happy to, to sit over. Does anybody have questions? Right hey, here? Thank you for this is fantastic. Um, I'm just wondering in the natural environments where the existing oak trees are dying back, um, is there any um, one <laughs> looking to accelerate the progression to the thriving oaks, <laughs> throwing acorns out there or something? So that the local habitat, the local animals, local oh. acorns. In other words, this is all done like, and in, in, I mean, this is expensive making a whole plant, but can you throw acorns out there without? Yeah, you can, but but the truth is acorns are unpredictable genetically. Okay. So you never know if you're going to get a good one. And you'd be shocked how cheap that plant is to produce. Oh, is it? Okay. Oh, you bet. We're producing <laughs> them hundreds of thousands at a time. And wow. they can make them grow super fat. No, no, no. It's not expensive. That's the way to do it. And if you guys want to see this in action, they've started hiring me here in Santa Barbara. So if you go out to Ealings, where they have a yes. new garden up there, they're also doing tree reforestation, but they're doing exactly what I tell them to do. So they put in 100 over the winter. And I think we still have 98 alive. And in fact, they're popping out of their little two-bex tree shelters. So no, it's starting to happen all over the state. I'm going to be working Trout Club, Innisbrook, Ealings, probably several other places. And people are very excited about it. We've needed new ideas in the horticulture world for a long time. And somehow, I don't know how I turned into the, the a horticultural futurist, but I did. And then when Steve found me, Nobody knew who I was when Steve found me. It's like he found me out of the blue, realized that I knew what I was talking about, and then he just strapped me to a rocket ship. <laughs> and then he promptly died. Fired me six months later, he was gone. Oh, wow. And I was there for seven years. So I had, and boy, when Steve died, Steve was the guy who weeded the garden. Steve was the guy who got rid of the people who weren't productive. Mm -hmm. And when he died, the weeds started to take over the garden. Mm -hmm. But it looks like Tim Cook's kept it together because they got more money still than anybody on the planet. So I just got a question about pines. I have, I have one in my front yard that is enormous. So years ago, we talked it be, so it wouldn't you know, grow to 120 feet on the street. But it, it used to always make babies said him good seeds and I used to give them to the cities and they would plant them in the forest and park areas and then didn't for a while and then last oh, two years ago it made some more but it was like two or three and what? that was it and I, someone said well pine trees stop Oh, no, no, no. If anybody who tells you some really hard rule of thumb well, about a culture, yeah, just ignore them because now nah, nature doesn't have heart. She plays all kinds of well, games. Wow, beautiful baby. And it was yeah, yeah. What species it's, is it? It's the one in southern Arkansas that's really that sagatory on the brain. Yeah, yeah. yeah. No, no, I don't know pines that well. It's really large. It's not going to help. So your 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 pine, your pine got unhappy because we've been in five to seven years of right. hellacious drought. But I have really up until pain. this year, and now everybody looks fine. <laughs> I was stunned by how quickly the trees recovered this year. That was nice because I was starting to get really depressed because my brain is just hooked right into the tree canopy. My, I, I have a photographic memory. You couldn't do what I do if you didn't. 
So whatever is in the visual field is in my brain. And when all the trees are dying, I'm not well. So when all the trees look happy, you'd be surprised. It's like somebody gave him some lithium. So did you have a question about your pine? Well, I was just wondering if that was true because what happened was some were growing and I was going to move them because they were close to the house. And my neighbor came over with this weeder beside them when I was gone. And it. it was growing beautifully and it rained all winter on it. And I was so happy. And yeah, yeah. Well, you did, did collect some seeds next time. Yeah. Hey, Dave, we have some questions yep. from the chat and from the group. Let's see, Janice, you have your hand raised. Do you want to unmute and ask something? You have to unmute. You need to unmute yourself. Yep. There you I go. got it. Hi there. Uh, I had a question in the chat and I'll just ask it now. Um, and you know, all the ficuses we have on State Street that break up the sidewalks all the time. And I'm just wondering what would be a good sidewalk tree for the future? Uh, several of the possibilities that I just laid out for you. So it, the, the answer to that is that I get hired by municipalities to write their city street tree lists. So I could give you a list of 30 trees. There's no one, there, there's no, you never want to just plant one kind of tree, but there are, the, the ficuses have not been planted in those kind of locations anywhere for like 40 years. So when it, when it comes time, you should get City of Santa Barbara to hire me to rewrite their street tree list. <laughs> <laughs> That's what I do. I wrote the list. I wrote the list for city of Oakland last year, city of San Mateo. I'm currently writing it for Stanford. So it, it, it's a long list. No, a short answer won't do, but you're, you're, you, you can find me. My website is octopia.org. And I'm Dave at octopia.org. So you feel free to fire me off questions if they don't fit in this format. Thank you. We had a question from Kent who asked, uh, replacing oak species with different oak species from different regions, do you feel like you're abandoning the idea of native species or augmenting? Oh, for sure, augmenting. Yeah. Because what's native here now is actually at the highest likelihood of failure. We're going to need new natives. So these are the obvious, I've selected the obvious next choices. So it's very much augmentation. An example, at Apple Park, the, the core of the landscape, 25% was local native, 50% was California native, 75% was native to the Americas, and then the last bit included the Mediterranean area of Eurasia which has many kinds of oaks. But at the core is biodiversity, and at the core are the best of the local native trees. So it's very much augmentation. Mary asked, uh, a recent paper in Science indicates that trees of any type cannot undergo photosynthesis at temperatures of 116 degrees Fahrenheit or higher. How long do you think it would take a large tree to die if temperatures hit 116 only for a couple of days a year or will temps under 116 kill it so pretty bad <laughs> so that question is so accurate that it's uncomfortable i know <laughs> so i've watched some of my trees take 117 in the bay area in 2017 they hit 117 but it was only for like half a day and it didn't kill anything. If it went on two or three days and it started to get like Phoenix, everybody hear about Phoenix this summer, 55 days above 110? Yeah, that stuff starts happening and you're going to start losing trees. We, we don't know the answer. And, well, it's good that we don't know the answer to that question because we really haven't experienced it. The fact that we are about to experience it means we're about to learn a lot about heat tolerance and trees. Sorry, that was yeah, it. I know. <laughs> I've, so, got a, I've got an avocado tree in my yard here. And uh, a couple of years ago, the temperature hit 
On my thermometer, it said 118. I don't know how accurate my thermometer is. It's here in Santa Barbara near the Botanic Garden. Yep. But it just about killed the avocado tree. One day at 117, we uh, had to trim it almost entirely, and then we had to paint the uh, paint the limbs with paint to keep the uh, wow. limbs from being sunburned. And this is uh, a couple years later. Now we're finally getting a couple more avocados in. The tree's looking a little bit better. It survived, but barely. I've got a house in Mission Canyon, and I think I remember that particular day. Yep. <laughs> so the trees aren't the only ones that wilt in the heat. Right. <laughs> okay. most, of the rest, most of the rest of the trees did fine. It's just the avocado tree just about died one day. Yeah, well. Avocados are real kind of water lovers, and they grow up in the mounds where it's a little cool. Their leaves are really thin. Heat tolerant trees need thick leaves with a big old waxy cuticle to slow. Okay. Other questions from the Zoom or in the room? Go ahead. I'm serious. Is there any, you had mentioned a native uh, plant uh, nursery, and this one that is growing now, the more tolerant plants. Is there a place where a local homeowner could, you know, go and just find these plants uh, in one nursery or anything yet? No. Oh, just but I, I'm trying to figure out. We need to have a little boutique type nursery here in Santa Barbara. Yes. I could sell this stuff all day long. And I'm going to talk to the owners of Devil Mountain because they, they, we got to start bringing these trees to town because there's so many people who will just suck this stuff. Oh, yeah. Even if we just bring them to the farmer's market. Yes. During the Maybe that's what I'll try to that do this year. That's a good idea. Oh, you guys are all nodding. Okay. I'm going to keep working on that one. <laughs> I, I remember in the 60s, there was a group called the Tree People, and they were replanting the Santa Monica Mountains. I don't know if they were using natives or how many, but they had... Bring your milk cartons from school and we'll put a pine in it. And they had little kids going up into the Santa Monica Mountains. I don't know if those were natives, but I mean, they, that would be a wonderful were, thing. That was Andy Lithgis. Yeah, it's one of the most famous tree stories in California. And did they take it and do well? Or did they? I haven't gone and looked. I know a lot of them did. So, but I think they also had pretty big losses. But Tree People survives to this day. Oh, does it? Oh, yeah. They've probably got 100 employees. They're a giant nonprofit in L.A. They've got a headquarters in Coldwater Canyon. Yeah, they're up in the canyon. Yeah, they're up in the canyon. But, yeah. So, I think it was mostly me. You had a question. Well, a little different subject. Uh, before... Uh... Settlers came here. The Indians lived on acorns, mm -hmm. and I wondered if there, if they, if there's any evidence that they did any uh, selective breeding of oak trees. Yeah. No, a okay. lot of us who've done this for a while have suspicions, because like the native walnut trees, sometimes you'll find native walnut trees in very special places, suggesting that they planted them. They were heavily involved in the management of the oaks because they really were living off the acorns. Most of the management, I believe, was fire. Be because what happens often in California is if they didn't do fire, pine trees moved in. And the pines didn't make them any food. So it was the, the oaks can tolerate light fire. Pines can't. So that's the, that was the main thing. But I suspect Aboriginal peoples have been doing selection all over the world for at least 40,000 years. Well, I meant that uh, the Aboriginals experienced climate change, too. I wondered if they changed modified species or... Ooh, wouldn't that be it? We don't have that kind of resolution in the last climate, in the, the last transition out of the last ice age, more or less the younger driest period. I don't think we've got enough resolution on archaeological and anthropological data to answer that, but I am curious about that question also. If I had some data, but pollen studies, I guess. Pollen studies are the way. I haven't spent a lot of time in that, but maybe maybe someday I will. <laughs> maybe I'll go back and get a PhD. <laughs> <laughs> well, how, how would it, insects would be a list out of the monastery of pines, for example? Just not only is it changed whether it changed the climate and changed their predators. 
Oh yeah, that's what I'm wondering at this. Wait, raise the question again. Well, I guess the the the, 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 the beetles have made a man have killed, I guess, what a quarter or a quite a lot of the trees at, at Yosemite, for example, the Monterey pines. It just seems to get the Monterey pines, but but the trees are subject to to insects, which um, you know, they, and they they weren't there in so, previous climates. So here's something that. that it, it, it's a perspective that I offer to you. The pests are all secondary. The primary stressor has been drought. Uh -huh. When a tree becomes stressed, trees are filled with chemical defenses. They make literal chemicals that repel insects. Like so yeah. when the, that is how their immune system yeah. functions. When they're stressed, when they don't have enough water, they can't make their chemicals. Uh -huh. And then everybody wants to blame the beetles, but the real cause was the drought. So if you kept them watered, you'd do better. You, yeah, you can we, see it in water one of ours and it died, and that was that. Beetles. Well, so once you got the beetle, crazy. once the beetle populations are really huge in an area, then all sorts of things start to happen when you start to have populations. But it's when there's only a few stressed trees, they'll find those. Uh -huh. But once population builds up, then you kind of escape the drought dynamic into, but direct pest attack, the, the insects are just going to move with the trees. The trees are the foundation, especially the oaks. This is a point I didn't make. I'm sorry. This is really important. The reason that I do oaks is because the oaks are the foundation of biodiversity in California. 80% of all different kinds of living organisms live on oak trees. Wow. And that is the same throughout the mid latitudes of the entire planet. The oaks rule from the tropical forests up until you hit the boreal forests. In the mid latitudes throughout the planet, oaks are the basis of biodiversity. Oh, okay. And that's why they're so critical. And frankly, if you go back before agriculture, I think human beings were eating a high percentage of diet as acorn. Because sometimes I feel like my insights into trees are like weird. It's like it's coming out of my DNA. Yeah. And because I've done things like seen an oak tree somewhere for the first time and correctly identified it, a tree I'd never seen before repeatedly. So... My my friends in the International Oak Society ask me ID questions, <laughs> but we're losing. We're we've got a bunch of oak trees, and we're getting this powder on them. They're they're live oaks, as I've always known them at. But it must be a California live oak, and it has this powdered stuff on them. Coast, yeah. it's it's yeah. called Coast Live Oak. Is the official Coast common live name? Quercus agrifolia. Are they going to lose some of those? Uh, they're get, so that's they're powdery mildew. Lifetime, hopefully. <laughs> so is it the new growth that's turning white, like little yes. witch's brooms at the end yeah. of the branches? Yeah. Yeah, that's very common. How close are you to the ocean? Uh, we're, well, we're uh, on off State Street, State and Alamar, Mission Creek. So it's, uh, yeah. well, what, 10 miles probably. Oh, yeah, you're up in... There, it, it's kind of weird. Not many coast live oaks around this area get powdery mildew. I've seen a handful. Unfortunately, I think you somehow ended up losing the genetic sweepstakes and got a bunch of susceptible individuals right around you. Because it's not that, it's much more common to see it. Like when you try to grow coast live oak in San Francisco in the fog, they just turn into mildew bombs. And usually we see it on the peninsula up in the Bay Area. Very little of it here. You kind of got unlucky. Most of us be nothing you can do about it then. It doesn't sound like there's something. Well, you can do. If you write down my email address, send me a couple pictures. Oh, and I'll try oh, to do I, it. I hope that I did. It's, it's Oaktopia, O A K at Oaktopia, O A K T O P I A dot O R G. Got it. Okay. I send me, it. Now I'm <laughs> curious. I also, just so you, I do work as a consultant, but I only do really interesting jobs. So the kind of thing, the kind of thing where you fired two consultants already, I'll come in and figure it out for you. That's what I like. I like the fun ones. Yeah, no, pretty much. <laughs> exactly. So are we 130? 
Um, yeah, we're 125. We can take uh, one, maybe one more question or so. Is there any um, attempt to find um, uh, more resistant uh, individuals of these species like uh, that are more resistant to mold totally. to promote those. Um, so totally. a group of a group of white ones and one of them is looking a little better. And okay. oh yeah, no, that's exactly what I do. Like under the trout club where we're going to be planting, I told them which of the trees on the property to source their acorns from. Okay, perfect. Oh yeah, no, no, no. That's an important part. You got to find the best of the local stuff. To build, and then you augment with my climate change right. migration species. But you always want to start with the best of the local stuff. Right. Uh, Mary had a question. Mary, you you talked about the net leaf uh, of picking up particulates from the atmosphere on the underside of the leaf. Now, is that eventually going to kill the tree if it isn't washed off? I don't think so. I've been I'll finding it on more and more. The, the trees that we're growing next to the freeway have been there now for 15 years and they're just getting bigger and bigger. And I know they're just collecting more and more. The thing, Mary, that you need to understand is that every tree sheds its leaves eventually. Even an evergreen, the longest it'll hold a leaf is two or three years. Okay. So you just get a couple years buildup and then the leaf is shed. All right. Okay. So they're doing fine. They're helping us and it's not hurting them. Yes. Wonderful. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Oh, there's somebody in the corner there. Oh, um, in the corner, the the 908 Yes, yeah, right there. Right. It's this one. Go ahead. Looks like you're unmuted. Go ahead. Sure. Speak up. Okay, am I on? Yes. yes. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Um, Charlotte Tyler here. We we had a, a a large pepper tree on our property and it began to die. And uh, so we called UCSB and they came out and deep watered and deep fed it and it's doing beautifully. What is the history? Uh, how long do pepper trees live and where do they do best? So, uh, pepper trees in Southern California can be century trees. So they can live for a hundred years, but if you put them in the wrong place, they don't do anywhere near that. It sounds like your tree that was just really drought stressed. Was that within the last five years? 20. 20 years ago. 20 years ago. And it was saved by... Got it. You're correct. By deep Is watering it still and there? deep feeding. Yes. What does it look today? Fine. Wonderful. Good. Knock on wood. Okay. So they're century trees. Thank you. <laughs> so if it starts to look bad again, do the same thing. Okay. Thank you. I will. Yes. <laughs> Thanks, everyone, for coming century to the meeting. Thank you.